is here. I'm wondering if you can guess the last time he was here at the Dickinson County Museum to speak. What's your guess? You know too much, Tom. <laughs> Don was last here in 1975 when the depot was rededicated as a museum. Wow. So that makes his return visit here even more special. Don has been a professor, he's a prolific author, he is a trained geek. Is that, do you think that's a good word for you? <laughs> okay. What else would you like me to say, Don? That's enough. <laughs> I'm going to turn this over to Don. And Don, thank you so much for coming.
not to be able to go more regularly. <laughs> but it is surely no lack of desire on my part. <laughs> As we grow older, it seems to be more of an effort, particularly in cold weather. If you decide to come down to the campground, perhaps I could go with you the first time you go, sit with you, and introduce you to the other folks. <laughs> Remember, this is a friendly community. <laughs> How many of you rode into or rode out of Spirit Lake as a ticketed passenger on a regularly scheduled train? One, two, three, four. Five. Five. Well, that makes this task a little bit awkward. Um, at least five of us know about that there were railroads here. Spencer, in 1948, when we moved there from Fort Dodge, had 18 regularly scheduled trains a day, except Sunday. 18. Spirit Lake, in, 18, in 1948, had eight regularly scheduled trains trains a day, except Sunday, and even the Rock Island had a, a Sunday. Milwaukee entered its passenger service in 1952, the Rock Island in 1950. Today, I suspect maybe, Meredith, you can help me out on this, uh, maybe, uh, what, a half a dozen trains a week in Spencer? Maybe? It's kind of irregular. Uh, it seems like to hear something around there. Uh, every day, every other day, something like that. So what a dramatic change in a relatively short period of time. There was a time, and it's not so long ago historically, when there was in fact an age of railways, a steam car civilization. If you were going someplace, you took the train. If you mailed a letter, it would be handled on the railway post office in the RPO car. If you were going to order something from Sears Roebuck, it would be delivered by express. If you were shipping bulk commodities and livestock, it went by rail. It was the age of railways. It was the steam car civilization. How di very different from our time. A little historical background, and help me with your, your own personal graphics here. North of here was a horizontal line of the Milwaukee Road that went through Jackson, Minnesota. South of here was another horizontal line on the Milwaukee Road from Mason City, Algona, Spencer, and Sanford, and Sheldon. But between them was this land mass that would be invaded, as it were, certainly the Milwaukee Road thought it was that way, invaded by the Burlington Cedar Rapids and Northern Railway. An angular line that, that pushed up from Cedar Rapids through Iowa Falls, Clarion, and Emmitsburg, and then to Esterville, turning west then to Spirit Lake in 1882, and off to the west. To the west was another angular line from St. Paul to Sioux City, the St. Paul and Sioux City Railway, today the Union Pacific. Urged by this, the Milwaukee Road in 1882 built a spur from Spencer up to Milford, stalled there, and then in 1883 got the line pushed through to Spirit Lake. Today I'd like to visit with you a little bit about the uh, Bella Polk uh, era, it might be called, of uh, railways in the Spirit Lake area of the 1880s, the 1890s, and the 1900s. So if you wish, uh, come along, but before I start, I want to admit that there's a person in the audience here who has forgotten more about the Lakes area than I ever knew. It's Aubrey LaFoy. He was my uh, student teaching supervisor at Mason City. Would you believe? He flunked the guy just before me. Do you suppose I was a little fearful about this? <laughs> But uh, not only did I survive, but I learned a great deal from Mr. LaFoy. Thank you. And, uh, and that is true, incidentally. And moreover, Aubrey is the finest middle school, that is to say, junior high 
social studies teacher I ever encountered anywhere. Aubrey Little. So come along. Let's look at some snapshots of the Lakes area during the age of railways. I'm to that point in life where I have to have a different pair of glasses. The optometrist says, why don't you get bifocals? And I said, why don't I get an optometrist? <laughs> Des Moines and Fort Dodge Railroad, which had an angular line from Des Moines through Fort Dodge to Ruthland, had a trackage right agreement in the summer of 1883. The Fort Dodge Road then instituted a daily through train operation in each direction between Des Moines and the lakes. Fare, $7.30, round trip. The editor of the Spirit Lake Beacon was predictably ecstatic about this. Remembering the old stagecoach and the roundabout trips by rail, it seems strange indeed, said he, that we are now only nine hours from Des Moines, and that the capital may be visited for only a trifling sum as compared to that in the past. And now it all can be done without a change of cars. Not to be forgotten, um, was the, the, in the, pardon me, the uh, summer operation. Um, and then the Milwaukee Road increased its importance in the rapidly increasing lakes traffic. From the mid-1880s through the following decade, during the summer months anyway, two trains plied the line each way daily except Sunday, connecting Spencer, connecting at Spencer with trains of the Milwaukee Road's Iowa and Dakota Division main line. There were, of course, uh, infrequent excursions. One of these, originating at Esterville on June 3, 1883, reportedly all but depopulated that city. Prior to the mid-1890s, the Milwaukee Road replaced the BCRN as the Lake Area Premier Passenger Carrier. Both had three stations to serve the region, Orleans, Spirit Lake, and West Okaboji, north of what now is known as Triboji Beach on the BCRN, Arnold's Park, Okaboji, and Spirit Lake on the Milwaukee Road. Of these, Arnold's Park was becoming the favorite, and the reason was partly attributable to the popularity of the Milwaukee Road's passenger service. One observer who took a jaundiced view of this was nevertheless forced to acknowledge that Arnold's Park was coming to be the storm center, he said, for excursions over the Milwaukee Road, which every year are growing in number, magnitude, and popularity. In 1897, the editor of the Spirit Lake Beacon complained that the only Fourth of July celebration in Dickinson County that year would be at Arnold's Park. He predicted that the wood will be full of people in that vicinity, and it might admit it that a great time was anticipated. A week later, he reported that the trains from Spencer brought 600 people, and 950 went down from Spirit Lake by train. The excursion traffic continued in its upward spiral. On one Sunday, in the summer of 1898, the Milwaukee Road operated two special excursion trains to Arnold's Park from points east and west of Spencer. The train from the east was heavily loaded, but its counterpart from the west, numbering 17 coaches, was probably the largest that ever came to the lakes. In all, the Milwaukee Road sold 2,000 tickets that day for two special <coughs> trains. The editor of the Beacon, always concerned with public morality, later was pleased to report that the entire aggregation had been, as he said, exceedingly orderly throughout. In 1899, the largest crowd to date converged on Arnold's Park for the 4th of July. An estimated 1,000 arrived on the Milwaukee Road alone, and the editor breathed easier for there had been, as he said, very little evidence of drinking. 
<laughs> Another place of attraction was traditionally swelled excursion traffic uh, for the annual Chautauquas held in Spirit Lake. The Spirit Lake, uh, the Spirit Lake Park Association had, early in 1892, constructed an auditorium on the northwest shore of East Okaboji, north of the city. Sometime later, the Spirit Lake Park Association was merged into the Spirit Lake Chautauqua Association, which survived for many years. It all augured, augured well for the railroads, especially the Milwaukee Road, since Chautauqua season always promised heavy passenger travel. The St. Paul Road ordinarily operated special trains in this connection, and it further assisted the Chautauqua promoters by agreeing to hold its regularly scheduled trains until the end of entertainment. Let me digress for just a moment. If this were a university setting, let's make it into one. This is Spirit Lake University. And at the Spirit Lake University, I think this should be labeled, this, this discussion and this presentation should be labeled, the Nancy Chapman Christensen Memorial Lecture. Nancy was a classmate. I talked to her just before she died. She mentioned that she had been here back in 1975 for the opening. We discussed that. I said, I'd be happy to come back sometime. With that, she talked to Mary. Mary called me, and I am here. So, Nancy, this is for you. <laughs> The Central Iowa Railway, which made close connections at Mason City Junction with trains of the Milwaukee Road to and from the lakes, was also heavily involved in this sort of thing, and especially solicited traffic that would come that rather indirect way. And then there was a narrow gauge railroad that pushed out from Des Moines up to Fonda, and then lacking resources stalled there, but in 1891 the road did get standard gauge, and then in 1899, the entire enterprise passed the Milwaukee Road, which promptly decided to project its extension from Fonda up to Spencer. Again, that would be Des Moines, Fonda, Spencer, now connected with the line up to Spirit Lake. There were numerous ramifications from this, the primary one being that Spirit Lake finally had a direct single line road to Des Moines. It also resulted in the concomitant demise of the Des Moines Spirit Lake summer operation heretofore offered by the Des Moines and Fort Dodge Railroad. It also meant that a greater importance was attached to the stub line from Spencer to Spirit Lake. Now it was no longer a branch but a part of a through line. As a result, the first permanent depot building was constructed in 1901 at Arnold's Park. These several railroads ordinarily promoted the, entirely, the entirety of the lakes area as a whole. Naturally, however, each of the carriers which served the area stressed the relative advantage of the individual lakes closest to its own stations. Thus, the BCRN's promotional energies were addressed towards Spirit Lake, particularly during the salad days of its hotel Orleans. The Milwaukee Road, on the other hand, favored West Okaboji. Its stations, of course, at Okaboji and Arnold's Park were near the lake. Representatives of the many advertising tracts which BCRN issued to promote the lakes area were Guide to the Summer Resorts, Spirit Lake and its attractions, and the road's classic, A Breezy Beach, or Spirit Lake in the Dog Days. In the last mentioned pamphlet, the BCRNN writer contended that of the several regional lakes, the great center of attraction, the incomparably beautiful Spirit Lake, possesses such marked individuality that it has impressed its name, not only upon the township in which it is located, and a little town in the adjoining township, but upon the entire district 
although it has 20 sister states and lakelets within a radius of 10 miles. The same writer glowingly pictured Spirit Lake as a large body of water with a shoreline of 14 miles, uniform in shape, surrounded by heavily timbered forests, free from weeds, full of fish. Specifically, Spirit Lake was praised for its picturesque shores, glistening beaches, luxurious woodlands, and inexhaustible store of fish and game. On the other hand, the Milwaukee Road and the Central Iowa Railway, which made connection with the St. Paul Road, with the Mini uh, Milwaukee Road at Mason City, and which competed with the BCRN for St. Louis traffic, favored West Okaboji. Without wishing to disparage the many attractions of Spirit Lake, the unanimous verdict, according to a scribe and the employee of the Central Iowa Railway, was that West Okaboji was the queen of the lakes. The writer further claimed further claimed that traveled people labeled West Okaboji as the most beautiful body of water <coughs> in the United States. Her 37 miles of wooded shoreline, picturesque banks, clear, cold, pure, deep water. Her rocky shores, broken at intervals by long stretches of broad sandy beach. Her delightful climate and pure air combined to make her peer of any body of water of like size in America. BCRN was particularly energetic in boosting Spirit Lake country. It was particularly interested in attracting patronage from among those unfortunate souls who lived in far off Illinois, Missouri, <laughs> Indiana, and in fact throughout the entire Mississippi Valley. In comparison to the grim living conditions of those areas, the lake lands of northwest Iowa offered by contrast delightful summer days which might be passed, according to one BCRN promotional flyer, in a playground and sanitarium for the votary of country pleasures and the overworked denizens of the Great Valley. While it was simply a burden even to exist during the summer in other areas of the country, the surroundings and all the conditions were at the same time in the lakes area sufficient to make life a perpetual delight. <laughs> the Central Iowa Railway similarly noted in its praise of the area, its writers asserted that as a health resort, the Spirit Lake region was not excelled. Additionally, Central Iowa propagandist enthused, the area was completely free of malaria. In a promotional booklet distributed by the road's general passenger and ticket department, the good but overworked and nervous people of its trade area were counseled to pr purchase tickets for stations in the lakes area since it was there that they would find rest and comfort and where, incidentally, sufferers from hay fever would find immediate Relief. <laughs> a writer for the BCRN went even further. In the whole region, from the Missouri River to the Atlantic Ocean, only Northwest Iowa, he contended, was perfectly free from enteric, cerebral spinal, and typhus fevers. Dickinson County, said he, possessed a climate distinguished not merely for the negative quality of freedom from malarial and endemic diseases, but for the positive <coughs> virtues that spring from a pure atmosphere and from health-giving and invigorating breezes. <coughs> However, the salubrity of the climate was hardly the area's sole national asset. The place is not more peculiarly adapted to the wants of the valedictorian argued the BCRN's general passenger agent, than to the requirements of the angler, the oarsman, the artist, the botanist, the archaeologist, and those who merely seek a change of scene and a general good time. <laughs> of these several groups, the angler, the fisherman, received the greatest attention. 
that fishing was good in those days cannot be doubted. One writer even claimed that the ease and readiness with which fish were taken in the early days robbed the sport of its greatest charm. A BCRN spokesman echoed him. Local anglers declared that in these lakes, fish are really too plentiful for fishing to be thoroughly enjoyable. <laughs> in spite of such formidable obstacles to piscatorial pleasure, this railroader was, nevertheless, forced to concede that there still were foolhardy types in the lakes area who periodically faced that most terrible terrors, the swamping of their boat with the immensity of their catch. <laughs> So it went with fish stories. Yet the catches were impressive. The Des Moines Tribune of May 18, 1911 reported, for example, that a party from that city had shipped home as a result of the first day's catch, 47 pike, 110 perch, 5 pickerel, and 4 silver bass. <coughs> My lies are stacking up. <laughs> BCRN crews, construction crews, followed locating surveys in 1882 out of Emmitsburg to and through Grettinger and Wallingford, crossing the Des Moines River at Esterville, then turning west to touch Superior, Orleans, and Spirit Lake. Track layers were expected to reach the isthmus between Spirit Lake and East Lake Okaboja by July 7th. But they beat that target by a day or two, and locals applauded orderly crews, noting little drunkenness. <laughs> <laughs> the first train, a special from Cedar Rapids on July 11th, brought company officials and friends who gushed enthusiastically that Spirit Lake was the finest body for resort purposes that is known in the Western world. Telegraph lines were installed the next day. The depot was opened on September 21st. Track, line, track laying crews paused briefly and then commenced their labors again by taking rail west to what existed or would be, would become Montgomery and Lake Park. Back in Spirit Lake, BCRN and others made bold plans to maximize potential for tourism. The Cedar Rapids Republican celebrated completion of the road to the lakes area of northwest Iowa and looked forward to the development of vacationing opportunities. The Burlington Hawkeye claimed that BCRN would not advertise the area as a summer resort in 1882, but would make a big effort to, for that place in the next year. Nevertheless, a few days later, the Hawkeye noted that the company was already selling 30-day excursion tickets, adding that the lakes abound in all varieties of fish which even the inexperienced angler will find no difficulty in capturing. Not long after, the Hawkeye ran a lengthy and glowing report of Okaboji, the summer resort of Iowa. Several Keokukians passed through Burlington on August 18th to escape the oppressive heat and humidity of southeastern Iowa by heading to Spirit Lake on a hunting and fishing excursion. Another party of 30 persons followed on BCR, BR, BCRNN cars the next evening. Spirit Lake is destined to become the most popular pleasure resort and it will soon take first rank in the West, exclaimed Hawkeye's exuberant editor. The big effort that the Hawkeye forecast for 1883 proved accurate. A grand hotel was planned on the south shore of Spirit Lake at the Isthmus. Formal opening of the largest hotel in Iowa blazed the Spirit Lake Beacon headline for June 22, 1883. A special edition of the Beacon a few days later uh, described the three-story edifice with five handsome towers, spacious dining room, a 3,000 foot veranda affording a grand promenade, Ex American Express and Western Union offices, telephone connected to the nearby town of Spirit Lake, a laundry, 
billiard hall, bowling hall, bowling alley, and of course, boats, fishing tackle, and livery, not to mention 200 guest rooms, all furnished in first class style with enunciators, gas baths, not, not gas baths, but gas <laughs> baths, <laughs> and all modern conveniences, including two doors, one leading to the corridor and one direct to the veranda. The Hotel Orleans opened on June 16 to host persons arriving on a special train that had originated in Atlanta, Georgia, hmm. making stops to pick up additional expectant excursionists in Cincinnati, Rock Island, Davenport, and Cedar Rapids, among other places. As it developed, the hotel for some years would be, faint, be far famed, far famed, as a resort, resort and rendezvous for Southern chivalry. BCRN, which owned the hotel, promised to solicit great throngs of the very best class of tourists. And to that end, published and widely distributed a handsome booklet entitled Spirit Lake and its Attractions. As one historian of the area later put it, the lakes area has never since seen the magnificence of the Orleans Hotel. No place was more enchanted by or enthusiastic over the charms of Spirit Lake and Okoboji than BCRN's headquarters city of Cedar Rapids. Early in August of 1882, President jo Joshua Tracy ordered up a fork car special and hosted company directors and officers plus representatives of the press from online communities for a visit of the lakes area. F. McClellan, the always spirited editor of the C Cedar Rapids Times, gush upon his return that there is no watering place or summer resort in the great northwest which will approach in general and particular attractions this spirit lake country. He was hardly alone in praise. In 1883, BCRN commissioned handsome and expensive pamphlets, spirit lake and its attractions, and summer resorts, northern Iowa and Minnesota which were distributed free of charge to a broad audience, and from which local media copied generous portions to inform their readers of the marvelous vacation opportunities now near at hand. BCRN likewise placed impressive advertising in city newspapers calling attention to the splendid Hotel Orleans and its attractive train service to Spirit Lake. On July 7, 1883, the Iowa route dispatched a special, a special passenger extra out of Cedar Rapids at 9 p.m., packed with vacationers bound for Spirit Lake and the Okaboja Lakes, where beautiful scenery, cool breezes, and boat rides were guaranteed to revive drooping spirits, restore waning energy, and give new vigor for all. On the 19th, another grand excursion train was operated under Baptist auspices. A few days later, the railroad advertised $5 round trips on regularly scheduled trains. Demand was heavy. The Gazette routine, routinely ran a Spirit Lake visitors column, listing by name area residents headed for the unsurpassed beauty and natural attractiveness of Spirit Lake country. Do not forget, the Saturday night excursion to Spirit Lake reminded BCRN's general ticket and passenger agent at Cedar Rapids on August 10. You can return home and you can return home in time for business Monday morning. Rates only five dollars for the round trip. Rates at the Hotel of Leans, three dollars a day. Elegant retining chair, retining, reclining chair car attached to train in which you can take a good night's rest for 25 cents. Go first class. BCRN not surprisingly stressed the Iowa route as the most expeditious means of reaching Spirit Lake country. The Cedar Rapids Daily Republican was not alone among online newspapers carrying a Spirit Lake hotel directory 
that included, of course, prominent mention of the Hotel Orleans, but also in 1882, as an example, Crandall House and, and Samson's Lodge, which, by the way, made no charge to guests for fishing tackle, bait, bathing suits, croquet grounds, hammocks, swings, etc. Large and often special movements to the area became routine. Methodist Sunday school children in 1882. Two trains on Sunday late in 1883, in the season of 1883, one from Cedar Rapids and the other bearing a party from Sioux Falls. Regularly scheduled passenger trains stopped to supper and breakfast at the Hotel Orleans. The Star, Bus, Dray, and Express line carried passengers to and from all trains, freight delivered to any part of town, and noted the proud local newspaper, BCRN Superintendent C.J. Ives had acquired a private cottage near Orleans. The discerning visitor would, without question, said BCRN, be drawn in extra to the magnificent Hotel Orleans, erected on an unrivaled site at the narrow isthmus dividing Spirit Lake from East Okaboja with 200 rooms, those to the north facing Spirit Lake, those to the south East Okaboja. Steamboats would take vacationers to any location among the lakes. Sailboats and rowboats were available for hire. Recreation options included riding, hiking, bathing, hunting for ducks, geese, prairie chickens, or fishing for perch, pike, bass. Those who wish to take their meals at the Orleans were assured that its cuisine will bear comparison with the most famous hotels in the country. Indeed, contended BCRN, it had done all there was that was necessary to place Spirit Lake in the front rank of American watering places. The company in 1885 carried the Hotel Orleans and grounds on its books at $102,000. 1885 dollars. Charles Ives and the company continued to enthusiastically promote Spirit League. Amid the inland seas of Iowa, at an altitude of 1,694 feet above sea level, a little bit of Eden which has left over, which has been left over for the 19th century enjoyments, easily accessible from all directions by Burlington, Cedar Rapids, and Northern Railway, and featuring a magnificent hotel called the Orleans, supplied with every convenience and luxury that modern taste, supplemented by lavish expenditures, can supply. Well supplied with gas, hot and cold water baths, is cuisine above reproach, with rates very reasonable, positively free from the annoyance of mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> Nearby stood Grace Chapel, the construction of which was incited by Mrs. C.J. Ives. Some visiting clergymen usually officiate to the moral edification of sojourners. Management of the Orleans did, in fact, offer a marvelous culinary selection from its expansive kitchen. For the 1890 season, early breakfast was served from 6 to, nine, 6 to 7 a.m., breakfast from 7 to 9 a.m., lunch from 1 to 2.30 p.m., dinner from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Nurses and children were served on a slightly different schedule. The very attractive menu featured chicken giblets a la creole with olives and cucumbers, boiled pickerel, butter sauce, potatoes, brabant, short ribs of beef, Polish sauce, roast beef, mutton, turkey with dressing and currant sauce, roast of veal stuffed with tomato sauce, curry of wow. Lamb, a la hand them. These selections were served with mashed potatoes, new peas, new beet stew, or cauliflower a la creme. 
For dessert, one could order pineapple pudding, a la Richaud, raspberry or custard pie, assorted cakes, chocolate ice cream, fruits or nuts, topped off with tea, coffee, or buttermilk. <laughs> Music was provided by Harry Sycamore's orchestra from St. Louis, which chose a selection of marches, overtures, and waltzes. BCRN added an important footnote with lasting legacy at the isthmus near the Hotel Orleans when it needed a bit more of, a, of three acres of land to the state of Iowa for use as a fish hatchery. When low water in the lakes later threatened the hatchery and its attendant nursery ponds, BCRN don donated to the state a former office car, which was then outfitted with large holding tanks to fill uh, tanks to bring to bring small fish to the Orleans hatchery from sloughs and backwaters of the Mississippi River near Sabua and Lansing. In that way, thousands of fish restocked the Iowa Great Lakes and others of the state's water bodies over several years. BCRN and other carriers moving the Hawkeye, the old office car, at no charge. During the years 1892-1894, BCRN made several capital expenditures, including uh, over $17,000 on the Hotel Orleans. In 1896, it was carried on the books at $127,737. But that once very bright star in the company's galaxy had faded, and it was doomed. The reasons were several. When the hotel was erected, the lakes boasted the highest water level ever recorded. Steamboats could make landings almost anywhere on Spirit Lake, and they could move with ease through the Straits and Narrows in East Okaboji and West Okaboji to and from BCRN station at Orleans and the Milwaukee Road stations in Okaboji and Arnold's Park to the amusement facility at Arnold's Park and to the multiple resorts scattered around the several lakes. But there followed drier years, and the water of Spirit Lake before 1898 dropped by eight feet, denying movement of the steamers out of that lake to the lower lakes. This ended the most enjoyable trips. Hotel revenues suffered accordingly. And of course, this was also the, the awful time of the Panic of 1893, which was the worst depression of the time until the Great Depression of the 20th century, a panic that lasted five years. The Orleans had been built with and operated with accommodations and service levels designed to please aristocratic patronage. Prices were set accordingly. But that level of customer, that level of customer base declined dramatically with hard times. Finally, there was the predictable love-hate relationship often found in resort areas between locals who at once delight in the area as an acclaimed watering hole and rejoice at the money spent so lavishly in the area by high-brow tourists, but also deeply resent those same seemingly uppity visitors and their seemingly <laughs> bohemian lifestyle. <laughs> Liquor, its availability and consumption proved a major fault line. There never has been a time in the history of the Lake Country when the law has been so shamelessly violated as within recent months along the south shore of Spirit Lake, <laughs> Bellow, the sanctimonious editor of the Spirit Lake Beacon on July 29, 1898, an apparent reference to the Orleans and environment. <laughs> A day later, the hotel was damaged by a storm. Revengeance of the gods, the editor, editor <laughs> like In May of the next year, gossipers claimed that the Orleans would be torn down. No, when another story, the hotel would reopen. Only the damaged part would succumb. A month later, wreckers told the story. The, ho the hotel Orleans is coming down while the lakes are rising and the summer resort boom goes merrily on, rejoiced the Spirit Lake editor. 
The Burlington Company built to have and to hold, to keep or sell, to preserve or destroy, but the hotel policy of, of the company is beyond comprehension, thundered the editor. <laughs> the Lakes Country of Northwest Iowa continued to be a draw, of course. Spirit Lake's annual Chautauqua, dating from 1892, always attracted large crowds to hear persons of national reputation, hatchet-wielding carry nation among them, speak on assorted subjects, but usually on topics dealing, dealing with moral issues. Many more simply sought respite from the summer heat and humidity. Spirit Lake and the Okaboges are beautifully located close together and their woods, wooded shores and gently sloping beaches with <coughs> cool depths and shining surfaces bring real joy to weary vacationists, wrote one railroad publicist. Excellent fishing is to be had and every opportunity exists for boating, bathing, and other manner of healthful sport. Gone was the Orleans, but the hotel accommodations in Lakes area are perfectly satisfactory. Geniality and good cheer are constantly in evidence, and the stranger soon finds himself a welcome member of that colony of pleasure seekers which he elects to join. The same railroad company continued to argue and provide brochures like, like Spirit Lake and the Okaboges, these on request. The Manhattan Hotel on West Okaboge urged passengers coming in on BCR, BCRN now that the Orleans was gone, to now be trained at the West Okaboja Station, west of the Spirit Lake Depot, about two miles. A passenger boat will be found there meeting every train, which will transport guests of the Manhattan for a day or more to and from the hotel without charge. After the demise of the Hotel Orleans, incidentally, BCRN had no further use for its elegant queen, which was sold to others taken off of Spirit Lake and pulled over to West Okaboji, where it would provide pleasure for thousands of persons well into the next century. I have argued in my book, uh, Prairie Oasis, that there was a symbiotic relationship between the railroads, the resorts, and the steamboats. Now, there was no time to deal with that today, and, and some of you know a lot about these topics anyway. That was kind of a short-term excursion into the bellipoke of uh, the railroads in the Lakes area, the 1880s, 1890s, into the 20th century. I would be delighted to entertain questions. Thank you. No question. Well, I had the privilege of sleeping in the fish car in the hatchery in the, in the early 40s. That late? Yeah. Fascinating. It was part of the south side of the hatchery, next to the bottom. Thank you so much. <laughs> Questions, arguments? Uh, <laughs> oh, what kind of class is this? How is it going to be treated for the depot there north of Tribosi? This fellow says there was a depot. Was it a depot or a shed? It was a depot. It was a depot. And the, the range of that depot is on that hotel that's at the north end of Tribosi there. So the, it's on the west end is, a, is the uh, original depot that was up there. Uh huh. Oh, did you hear? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Orleans had a standard yeah, plan on Rock right Island yeah. Depot. It was one of the 20 by 40s. It was erected after they got, uh, the railroad got rid of the hotel. It lasted into the 20s. And uh, according to the people I've talked to, the uh, Orleans building was moved sometime in the late 20s to a point along Hill Avenue uh, just north of the town limits at that point, and it was used as a house. And you could see it was a depot um, into the 1970s. <coughs> it's since been remodeled a number of times. The core of the building is probably still in there, but you can't tell it anymore. But that was where the uh, Orleans building was. It still is. Do you know if that was a staffed depot? Uh, it was a staffed depot. Was it summer only? No, because that was where the sister siding for Summit was. Orleans had a 17-car siding. Summit had a 17-car spur. 
I talked to railroaders who remember they would have a 35 car train, they would take the front half from Orleans up to Summit, run back down to Orleans, get the back half, and take it up, and then they would go on to uh, Esterville. Uh, most people looking at it wouldn't think that piece of railroad was very tough. Yeah. It was one of the toughest pieces of railroad to run a train on. Yeah. You can imagine. In fact, when they started running unit trains, one of the first major unit trains they ran through here, they broke in three pieces. <laughs> and they had to put it together, it had nine locomotives on it. And I was then standing there by overrockers. And they pulled up to me, and that engineer would not give up. He had those engines running in eight, and they were stock still. The ground shook, the air shook, everything. And then what you saw was the whole thing moved forward about a quarter of a turn of the wheel. Mm -hmm. And then there would be a wave, and then they moved another quarter of a turn. And over the next about five, ten minutes, he slowly got her going. And I've only seen that done one other time, and that was an engineer on the uh, IAB down by Ruthven. Well, uh, that was that was something. You you literally were shaking inside because they were they were going wide open. Yeah. And he just kept moving that throttle back and forth and just moved her up the hill. They got her up the hill and boom, they were gone. Yeah. Summit, of course, is a, is a top of a grade, and one doesn't think of a grade in this part of the world. No, summit was not the top of the grade. Divide is the top of the grade. Yeah. Summit was uh, well, 190th the, Street, I think it is. Yeah. And you can still see the notch in the fence row where the track came off and went out into yeah. the field. Yeah, you don't think of doubling a train in this part of the world, but it happened. <laughs> yep. I've been able to locate all of the depots and where, what happened to them. But the one thing that really bugged me uh, is that we had a wonderful trestle right south of Melford on the Milwaukee. Yeah. And some idiot let them tear it down. It, it was it was a masterpiece of construction. And I remember walking across it many times when I was a kid, trying to I wondered if the train was coming while I was in the middle of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> it did, but uh, yeah, I always feel bad every time I look over there. I think, oh God, when we let that loose, you know. Yeah. yeah. Like say it was a park. <clears throat> there was a, a gravel pit just south of the bridge. And uh, the gravel was used to uh, for ballast on this line from Spirit Lake. I think during the war, during the Second World War, it was ballasted from Spirit Lake to Spencer from that Milford Pit. And that sand, a lot of it was what, what is used for fill from Arnold's Park that goes to Orleans. I mean, it goes over to uh, uh, the next town you know, over along there. It's still it's still in existence. It's now a park. The last use of that pit just south of the bridge of Milford was for uh, Milwaukee Road takes stock cars up there, livestock cars, and they clean them and put sand in for bedding. Uh. Mm -hmm. Any comments, questions? Lots of topics I didn't get to. Do you remember approximately what year the Milwaukee Road switched the passenger trains from diesel, that made for coal, over to diesel? Well, it wasn't diesel uh, up here. It was a gas electric operation, and that happened in the 19, early 1930s, as I remember it. And, and during the middle of, of the 30s, there were still two trains uh, each way on this line from Des Moines up here, and they were gas electric trains. Then, in the summertime, when demand was greater, they came off and they were steam powered, and that lasted until I know it lasted in. It was there in 48, 49, I think 50 was probably the last year of steam powered pattern, except for the last train up here, which was, was steam powered. They had, they had steam engines going through Milford when I was a kid all the time. Yeah. Uh, changing uh, freight cars or something like that. We lived about two blocks in the middle of the winter, and you know, you could feel it there in your house. Even. <laughs> and the uh, I uh, as a let's see about an 11 year old uh, 
went into the depot at Arnold's Park and purchased a ticket to Spencer <coughs> on the freight train. Mm -hmm. The freight train. They didn't advertise it, but it was in fact a mixed train. You could buy a ticket. And the conductor was nonplussed. You know, what do you do with this kid? He had paperwork to fill out. Anyway, other comments, questions? The word you're writing, freight train. Caboose. Yeah, caboose. And in those days, it was such a different era. Um, I would appear at the Spencer Depot and uh, take pictures with my Brownie 127 <laughs> and uh, engineer on the 33, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Bill Chase, William W.D. Chase. And he took note of me and uh, Later on, I went down to Fort Dodge and came over to Fort Dodge, from Fort Dodge to Fodham, waiting for 33 to come up to Spencer. He, he spotted me. And uh, we train got underway. The uh, brakeman came to me and said, uh, come with me. Come with me. And uh, what that meant was I was going to go right ahead with Bill Chase on that gas car from about uh, just the first station north of uh, Fonda to Spirit Lake. A sidebar to that, two sidebars to that. We came down the hill into Gillette Grove, and which is a flag station. And there's no flag, so we did not stop. But just about the time we got abreast of the depot, people poured out of the depot. And Chase saw that. He had the most marvelous vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're called expletives. <laughs> so we had to stop the train and back into Gillette Grove to pick up these people who were going to Spencer to do some shopping. And that was not too unusual back then, do shopping, and then go back on 36 at 7 o'clock that night. So, but anyway, between Gillette Grove and Spencer, something happened to the heating system. There was, there was a steam generator on that gas car. No fireman. He got up. The train is moving about 45 miles an hour down the track. He gets up, I'm sitting there, he gets up and goes back and corrects that thing. Now in my mind's eye, sure enough, there'd be a uh, freight train coming right at us. <laughs> I knew that that train was not due out of Spencer until we got there. Nevertheless, in my mind, here came that damn Iowa 62. <laughs> well, it didn't happen that way, and we got to Spencer and there were 62 of them say. Bill Chase, um, then uh, the, I rode with him on the Saturday before the last trip up to Spirit Lake. And Mary, where's Mary? Over here. Mary has a photograph that I made in the coach, the uh, chase and the baggage man and one other and well, Dyson. H.B. Dyson. Who was a deep agent. They're, they're playing cards in the coach. <laughs> Uh, then I, I think we went, there was a restaurant, I think, just, uh, not cafe, just down the track here on the right side, as I remember, we went there for dinner before we left, and on down to Spencer. Then uh, the following Saturday was the last run. Uh, I was down in Des Moines, rode all the way from Des Moines to Spirit Lake. It was a different time. The chase again. It was such a different time. Today you, you'd get fired for anything like that. Uh, but it was, if, if, you, if they saw, railroaders saw somebody who was interested in the railroad industry, come on, ride with us in the caboose and head in. Depot agents were the same. Come on, sit down, I'll tell you the tales of the rail. Very different times. A great blessing for me, I can tell you. Come on. So I understood you to say that way back when, uh, Spare Lake was the same level as Okaboji? No. Okay, yeah, I thought you said the chip could have lost food from one to the other. They, they could. They could at that time. Well, how? How if they weren't the same level? How could they move from Spirit Lake to East Okoboji? When the lakes were a different level. No, no. East Okoboji and uh, West Okoboji are all the same level. The only height is Spirit Lake yeah. is normally higher. <coughs> and. Uh, and it's 10 or 12 feet higher, or something like that, higher than it is East Okaboja. 
and uh, people always wondered why it didn't flow in, you know, and there's a barrier across there in Orleans. But the question is then, how could they ship, or then not the ships, but the boats go from Spirit Lake to East Okaboji? They could not. Well, they could, but at one point. Oh, you oh, mean, oh, from Spirit Lake? No, they had to get off, go across the Isthmus and get on a, uh, a steamboat over on, East on the north end of East, East Okaboji. That's not my understanding. At one point, there was a way to get from Spirit Lake to East Okaboji, but the question is, how did that work? Kind of like a never. Never happened. Never happened. Never happened. No. 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 Well, the kind of steamship went from Big Spirit to East was when they took the Queen in, in 1902 and dragged it over to East Lake. Okay. I stand corrected. Yeah. I just have to tell this. <laughs> when I was very young, I was talking now in the early 40s, and I lived in New Orleans, my sister and I, and my mother, would take the train from Spirit Lake uh, down to Milford, because my grandparents lived on the south side of Milford, right next to the tracks, by the way. <laughs> in fact, Augie knew my mother, Fleet. Remember that, Augie? Well, Dad, he doesn't hear what he said. And that's besides the point, really. I'll get back to the story. My sister and mother and I would travel down to visit my grandparents in Milford well, several times in the summer for several years in a row. And it was always a steam engine. But one time, I got to go by myself because I'd been through it often enough. I knew that I was supposed to get off on a third stop. Third stop was Milford. Well, this one time I got, when I went, um, it didn't stop in Arms Park. It stopped in Okaboji, hmm. but it didn't have to stop in Arms Park. And it went right down to Milford and, uh, and stopped there, which is the second stop. But I was waiting for the third stop. <laughs> and I was the only passenger on this pullman. This train, by the way, had, as a rule, usually a mail car and a cattle car and then a coach. And so, or pull. And so I was there, stopped there at Milford, and I didn't get off. And the conductor knew me from the past, and he also knew my grandparents. And and uh, the start, and I didn't get off because I didn't think I was supposed to. And the train went on, started up, from, and the conductor came back and said, "How come you didn't get off there?" And I said, "Oh, I didn't have a good excuse." He says, well, I know where your grandparents live. I'll stop the train at your grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> and that's precisely what he did. He got uh, next to my grandparents' property. The old steam engine shut down, and they let me off. And my grandmother said, where did you come from? <laughs> so that, that's my story. Boy, oh, by the way, for your benefit, I am an optometrist. <laughs> That was a reflection of the uh, friendly Milwaukee Road, incidentally. <laughs> the, only, the only time I ever rode that train and from Milford to Spirit Lake was my, my father had a butcher shop up there by the Antlers Hotel. <coughs> and he went to work, went to work to open it up. He had somebody open it up, but he would go up there. And then I stayed with him all day, and then we came down. Uh, I, I think it goes through Milford at 6.20 or something like that. And, uh, that's the only time I ever wrote it. Mm -hmm. we, knew, we knew what it was through. We, I worked for the Milford Mail for many years, and of course, Thursday we tried to get the paper out enough so we could get it stamped and put on the paper, uh, put on the train down there because it was thrown off at different locations yeah. as it went south. <clears throat> Do any of you know anything about passenger trains? on the Milwaukee Road to Spirit Lake, not to Spirit Lake, to the Lakes area after 1952 when the regular trains were discontinued? Well, they ran the uh, uh, National Guard trains up here. Not National Guard. 
or what was it? The U.S. Navy. Oh, it was the Navy. It was one of the military services. Yeah, yeah it was the Navy. Was that just Watch that out, was there might be a swabby in here. You can know <laughs> it's the Navy. <laughs> Was that just that one day that was our Navy day that the recruits yes. on? Yes. My husband was one of those recruits. Oh, and when I tell people about the fact that they had this big celebration in Arnold's Park and and you know bands and stuff from different towns yep. came and and they at the end of the day then the the recruits all got on the train and Went to took Great Lakes. Off for Great Lakes yep. training in Chicago. Right. And they looked at me like I had rocks in my head. And so I donated a picture of the our Navy group that my husband was in in 1956 to the museum and identified the three guys from Terrell that are on there and hoped that some other people would step up and say, well, I know those and those and those, you know, because there had to be a lot of guys that got on that train in 1956 yeah. and I when I talked to Mary a couple years after I gave her the picture she says there's not one soul that has been identified other than those three Terrell boys that yeah. you have told me about. Well, they were recruited from all of Northwest Iowa and I think probably into South Dakota too. And if you go to the museum the picture's still there. I donated it you know a few years back and and it's still there, they haven't taken it down for lack of interest or whatever, but I have trouble proving my sanity when I say that. <laughs> well, I think, it was, I think it was two years, I think it was 55 and 56. And for those of you who are railroad oriented, that train was actually backed from Spencer to Arnold's Park. Hmm. Really? <laughs> backed up. Yeah. You, you just don't do that. <laughs> backed up there. So when they cool. took off from Arnold's Park, they actually went Spencer first before they went to Oh yeah, them. yeah, it was a special train. And dummy that I was, I did not take a photograph of it. Early in World War II, yeah, it, the draftees from Dixon County would ride, ride the trains from there down to Camp Dodge. Uh -huh. And uh, I can remember being out there at the depot and waving at all the guys. Years older than I were. Yeah. Yeah. Just. Um, where did the line of Milford cross 71 go to Astoria? Or. Right by Casey, uh, Casey gas station down there. Oh, okay. Right in that stretch there. Yeah. Flipped over and then went the ground. And then went over that big trestle. Yeah. Right yeah. there. Herman Richter has an aunt that wrote a Three or four books about that trestle. In fact, it's kind of interesting. You got to do a story. Did you work for the railroad, or you just had an interest? In I was a section laborer at Spencer uh, one summer, and then uh, in the 1980s, I was corporate historian for Southern Pacific. Mm -hmm. That's when you decided to become a school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're partly responsible for that. Yeah. So he gets the blame. <laughs> I'll take it any day. I have one question. Did the, uh, the spirit of uh, Milwaukee ever connect with the Rock Island? Did not. Did 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 no way interchange here for some strange reason. Uh, they did try to make it once. Yeah. Uh, they lost their air up on the coming up the hill there by the ready mix plant. They made it almost all across the highway. <laughs> I can remember seeing that SD9 sitting out there all across the highway. They just, the next day they sent another engine up from Spencer and they blast on her and pull her back onto the track. They never did replace the uh, little thing at the end of the track, though. <laughs> turn to Don't. You're not supposed to tell stories like that. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, turntable was back there. Yeah. 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 And I just gave Mary a photograph of turning the gas car here. And um, there's a really beautiful one down at Boone at the Railroad Museum. If you have a railroad interest, you really need to stop at the Boone Museum. That's a very 
president. George Niles' photo of that uh, Corn Belt Group disc that CV Production has. They have Bill in the gas cart turning yep. down there. Uh, in fact, they've got the entire run from, I don't know, somewhere around in Marathon. You know, I think he rode from Des Moines up here, didn't he? Yeah, he, he was eight Des Moines, film. but I, th I think he, only, he didn't have enough film, so he just kind of, yeah. yeah. I remember uh, I, he went down through, went over my granddad's section at Joe Grove. I went through frame by frame trying to find my granddad. Didn't find him. Huh. But, uh, uh, yeah, but they do have them up here. And what they did is apparently they just took the, uh, Put the train, ran the car down onto the onto the turntable, and then released the brakes in the car, and she rolled down where the oil house was, and then they went back around, and they flipped it around, and hooked it back up, and off they went. Yeah. Were there any roundhouses in the area? There was an engine house here, but not a roundhouse. Oh, roundhouse in Esterville. Uh, not in Spencer. In Sandburn. Sandburn, yeah. In Mason City, of course. Sibley has a little one for a Was it a brown house or an engine? Well, I was part of one. Yeah. Just part of the section. Yeah. all these uh, younger people uh, during World War II, I was in, this, in World War II, the center service, and we would travel away by trains, you know, and then troop trains. And they weren't the uh, most uh, deluxe in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I can tell you a lot of stories. I went across India from, from Bombay, India to Calcutta on an Indian railroad. And uh, I'll tell you how fast it went. If we got tired of sitting, we got up and ran along the side. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't tell you about the uh, plumbing facilities. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. This is just fabulous. I loved all the interaction and the questions and the stories about the railroads of this area. Um, just a couple of things. If you enjoyed the presentation today by Don, we're passing the hat. And, um, Can I get it? You get it cut. Please feel free to to contribute. And also, Don, you are now a member of the Mug Club. The, the, the Mug Club. Our speakers at the Dickinson County Museum get a photo. Uh, get a mug with the depot it's on it. It's my mug. Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, I will leave out the photos that Don brought with him today. Um, Don also brought, if you have not read his book, Prairie Oasis, I would highly recommend it. Unfortunately, it's currently out of print, but I do know that all of the area libraries have copies of it. It's probably the best book I know would be around here. It's probably the only book, but it is definitely the best book. He brought another book for us, The Iowa Route, which I haven't even had a chance to look at yet. The VCR and end, uh, Railroad, uh, and there's a, a huge chapter on this area in here. So, we'll leave these photos back here behind Jonathan so that you can see the photos that he was talking about. Um, thank you again, John. Pleasure, and would you be willing to hang around? I see some people brought sure. some books and stuff. So thank you so much. I'm, but next